You are supposed to hear from him. This isn't some three-ring circus of, oh golly, thus saith the mouth of God. You're supposed to be hearing from God. The problem is, and the problem has always been, is the way God is, uh, has to find a way to communicate to you. And then we get these people that bless God that are always jumping over the fence. And who jumps over the fence? Not the sheep. The goats. Sheep never jump, jump the fence. The goats jump the fence. Oh. Oh. I believe we can run down there and get a word from the prophet tonight. Well, let's just, Pastor, we'll be back next week. Huh? Oh, wait a minute. Don't you think? Oh, let's go. Come on. Those are goats. Some of you sitting out here are definitely goats. Have been ever since you got in this thing. Become sheep. Become sheep. That's what God wants. He wants his sheep. Don't worry about being leaders. Don't be worrying about being prophets. Don't be worrying about being apostles. Dear God in heaven, if God wants you there, he'll get you there. But make God put you there. Does that make sense to you? Make him put you there. Don't put yourself over here and curse you and everybody you can get to listen to you because you want to be high and lifted up. Don't do that. My Lord and my God. Like I said, I, I, you know, I, 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 I just go through, I know I go through periods of time when people think I ought to be maybe put away. But you know something? I guard very, very closely the anointing. I guard it. It hurts me very, very deeply to see people rape the Holy Ghost, and they do. It really bothers me when people do that. Why? Because you're, they're hurting the program of God. Like I said to you over this guy in Oregon, don't you, do you think that hurt, hurts this prophet? You bet it does. What he doesn't know, he played right in the hands of the devil. And now for those of us who are out here doing it right, you just put another mark against us saying, oh well, yeah, I remember the guy out in that area. Oh yeah, well I'm sure he knows what he's saying. Let me tell you what the other part of it is. The people that get stung on the other side of it, you know what they get to be in? Yeah, I'll tell you what. I got, I got around an old boy I thought was a prophet, found out he wasn't. Yeah, I won't be, won't be listening to no more of that. What happens? You know, some people get stung hard enough with this thing. When they get stung, they go the other direction. They quit growing. They don't advance with God one iota. Now, who do you think won there? The devil. See, when, you, when you're, your goal is to, is by God is to grow up into this thing. That, that's the goal in which God has set for you in this. He has set for you to, to, to bless God, to, 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 to grow up, to get to the place where you can be more than a pain in a rump. All right? And what I see right now with the body of Christ and where they're at, they're nothing but a big pain in the butt. They're not any help. You should be helping, not hindering. Bless God, it shouldn't be that we, we have to baby you along and let you suck on the bottle for a while. And, uh, blah, 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 blah. No, no, you know, Paul, a long time ago, Paul said, let, you know, let, let's get away from those, 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 those elementary things. Let's get on to the deeper things of Christ. And we've never left those. We have never left that bottle-sucking stage long enough to get people where they'll grow up. You know why? Because people don't want to be told they're in sin, and they don't want to be told they're wrong. They don't want to hear that. That's the reason I can't be a popular preacher is because I don't have a popular message. God only knows I, I wish I had a popular message, but I, this is as popular as it gets. I can't, I can't help what God does in me. I can try to help what God's doing, what God isn't doing in you and what the devil's trying to do. I can help that if you'll let me. And that's, that, that's what we're here about this weekend. We are here to examine your life. See, uh, the God's Word will always cause us to examine ourselves first. Do you know when there's a problem in your life, do you know who you look at first? And me. When Don and I go through things, the first thing I do is look here at me. God, search my heart. Let me know if there's anything here that I've done wrong. That's the first thing you ever ought to do. And probably, I don't, I don't say I do it every day, but it's almost daily. God, search my heart. If there's anything, if there's anything here, I want to know what it is. Why? Because I want to be able to walk up right before you. See, I go back to the same thing, folks. It, it gets, uh, you know, 
miracles and healing are very, very simple when you look at it from, from just strictly the basis of the word. It just simply says that because what Yeshua came and did, the stripes that he bore upon the cross was then and is today are healing. That's the end of the matter. You're, you're already healed. It's not whether you're going to be. It's already happened. The problem that gets and where it gets so complicated are the things that can hold that back from the physical manifestation of that coming into your life. That's what happens. And when there's a curse involved, that will hold that back. I, you've heard me tell stories about the fact that I've had people, and one time I'll never forget, it was right here in this room. A woman came in, and she was a pastor's wife from quite a ways off, two or three hour drive. And she was a, a, he, he, a, and he was a pastor, and, or they were pastors of an Assembly of God church. Uh, and bless God, she had heard that God had used me uh, 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 for people to be healed, so she came, got in a service. She's standing right about there. And I came to her and I said, sis, what is it God can do for you? And she said, well, I got cancer, I'm dying. And she said, I, 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 I come to be healed. She said, I understand that God uses you in the gifts of healing. I said, well, yes, he does. So I started to lay hands on her and God said, don't touch her. He said, you go tell her or you tell her to go to her sister-in-law and tell her sister-in-law uh, 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 to beg for forgiveness. Her problem is a spirit of unforgiveness. I said, well, that's not going to make her very happy. He said, well, I'm not worried about her being happy. He said, you tell her what I said. So I told her, and sure enough, she stomped right around that way, and she went out those doors and stomped out that other door, and that was the end of that. I thought, well, that went over well. A few weeks or months, I think it was a few months later, actually, she came back, and she was sitting back over on this side, and uh, when it was over, uh, she stood up, and she said, uh, Prophet, she said, can I say something? I said, yeah, I'll go on. She said, well, she said, you know, I came and you prayed for me because I was dying of cancer and, 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 and you know, it made me mad what you told me and I, I, and I left. I said, oh, uh, really? It made you mad? Who could have told? Boy, you could have seen that old gal. She was stomping holes in that concrete all the way back through there and said, I said, oh, really? I said, none of us hardly noticed. And, and of course, we all did. And she said, well, let me tell you, went home, I was mad. And then I got glad, she didn't say that, but that's what happened. She said, I went to my sister-in-law and I repented. And she said, now I'm free of the cancer. Yeah. Now, what's that about? You see, it's about a curse. And see, people don't, think, people don't think anything about these things. People like me constantly are thinking about these kind of things. Because these things hold people back from the blessings of God. I want to see you blessed. Because if you are blessed, you can be a blessing. If you're blessed, other people are going to see that you're blessed, and they're going to begin to say, hey, they're different, I want to know why. The church isn't different anymore. we got as many problems inside as they've got in the world. And that's what's causing the people to say, well, why would I want anything to do with them? Why do I want to go to church out there with them people? They're all sick. Why do I want to go out there with them people? Bless God, they got all these things taking place then why would I want to go there you see that that's the kind of thing that we get into and 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 what are we going to say as the ministry what kind of excuse are we going to give those people as the ministry we can't give them any excuses it's the truth and bless God we've got to face the truth that we've got as many problems and much sin inside the building where it's not supposed to be as they got out here in the world you know it's the same thing I kept saying when I went back to the Jewish thing I kept saying, I said, you know, it's a wild thing to me. I said, the Jews are the healthiest and the wealthiest people in the world, and they don't even got Jesus. Think about that. They're the healthiest and the wealthiest, and they don't even got Jesus. And we're out here manufacturing all this baloney about how to become what? Uh, financially wealthy if we'll just give some preacher all our money. And I'm going to tell you something. There is, there is a plan that God has Bless God, divinely put into place for finances, but a given of your tithes and offerings isn't what that's all about, okay? If you'll read closely uh, over there where I was reading 28, I think it's there or in 30, you'll find out that the, in Deuteronomy, you'll find out that the Lord God is talking about that you will have finances. Now, what's it all relate back to? If you will keep the law. Now, let me go back, and some of you have heard this, and some of you know it very, very well. But the reason that the, 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 the Jews are all healthy is because they know if they attend synagogue and repent during Rosh Hashanah, during Yom Kippur, 
to bless God that they will be written in the book to have good success financially and otherwise all year. Every Jew that's worth his salt in this world will find, and he may not go to synagogue any other time in the year, but he will go during Rosh Hashanah. Kind of like us going on Christmas, isn't it? See if Santa Claus comes down the aisle and brings us a present. Come on, folks. It gets, you know, this thing is sick. It got sick a long time ago. Can you imagine, can you imagine what God must think? Can you imagine what God thought when we, and you know some of that's got around. I, I, I preached against Halloween back in the 60s. Uh, actually, it wasn't six, early 70s. Now, I got my life threatened three times by, by, by two uh, Assembly of God preachers. Yeah, because I was taking their fun away from them in the basement. I said, no, no, God says to abstain from all appearances of evil. Just to look at Halloween as evil, not even, even the concept of which it is behind it all. And anyway, I, you know, I began to do that, and I, I, and I finally said, I said, well, you know, I wasn't on a, a, on a nationwide basis at that time, but I said that somebody somewhere down the line, now listen to me, 15 years later, ministry started ministering against Halloween. And now we've pretty well made a, made a mark. Oh, I love it now. Well, now, now, Brother Decker, we're not having Halloween. What we're doing is dressing up as Bible characters. I said, why do you have to do it on the 31st day of October? Why don't you pick the, pick the 12th of July? Why? You know what it is? It's the same thing that they started when Christianity decided to start uh, celebrating Easter. It was a time when they, uh, you know, again, the Esther, with the, the fertility goddess, and, and they, so they got out on the streets and they were celebrating the, the death and resurrection of our Messiah, Mashiach, and just so they could be out there celebrating and be out in the streets and they would think that they were doing it for the, the goddess and all the time they're doing it for Jesus, and that doesn't work either. And so in time, it become known as Easter. And so we're out here still doing Easter, still painting the bunny, uh, the, the, the bunny rabbits and still got the uh, painted Easter eggs and the chickens. And, and you know, that's the reason then I always make the statement. And then we wonder why all of our young girls come up pregnant in the church. See, we're not even smart folks. We're not even smart enough to figure that out. We're not even smart enough to understand what God said to keep, to keep, to understand how Christmas, how Halloween, how, how Easter, how, 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 how all this stuff jumped in there. How did it ever get in the church? I'll tell you how it got in the church. They were sleeping dogs. They were after their own gain. They weren't after the welfare of the people. They were after their own gain. Let's go ahead and look like the world. See, now the big thing is to build a basketball gymnasium right connected to your church so they'll all come and play basketball and then we'll get, of course, in the Midwest, basketball's king, you know. And so they'll come to your church, and then you'll get them, you'll get them in the church. We'll have church growth. There, there are places building million, million, half dollar basketball arenas uh, so they can try to add people to their, to their uh, bless God, their, uh, their, their sanctuary. What's that about? That's an abomination to God. And you've got to understand that. These things are abominations to the Lord God. God is a, a, I always, I always try to put it in some kind of perspective uh, to get, under, uh, get people to understand, you, you know, God is a God of love. But there's the other side of this God of love, and He's a God of wrath. When you, uh, get, you know, when God kept sending the prophets, I knew America was in trouble 18 years ago. I knew it. Actually, it's almost 19 now. I keep saying 18. 18. Uh, and, uh, almost 19 years ago, and I knew it, and I'll tell you why I knew it. Because I couldn't get into the churches to prophesy anymore. We don't, we don't want you, Deckard. You're gloom and doomer. You come in and you say all this stuff. We, you know, we want it. You know, there's not, this stuff ain't going to happen. Dear God in heaven, this is America. There's not going to be famine in this country. Our kids are not going to starve. Blood's not going to run the streets. Who do you think you are going around saying those things? Get out of here. And I knew when I left this nation and began to minister in the third world, I knew this nation was in trouble because I knew that I was called to the nations, and I knew that I'm a major prophet to this, to this world, and I know that, and I knew that I had been, I had literally been thrown out of this nation, told to leave, to not come back. There was no room for me here or people like me here. Now, let me tell you what that's all about. That's just another mark, not the only one, but just another mark in a long group of marks where the Lord God sent prophets 
and they'd have nothing to do with us. Nothing. They would not listen to what we had to say. They had nothing, bless God, at all in them to want to listen to what we said. So what was it? We're gone. Now, that doesn't surprise me. See, God will send prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet until the Bible says until there's no longer a remedy. And when there's no longer a remedy, then God's no, got any other choice but then to send what? To send judgment. Now, what we've got going on now is, that, that, I know you all remember the, the fable, uh, bless God, uh, about uh, when uh, uh, a crying wolf, when there wasn't a wolf. And, and, and we won't go through the fable, but you remember that. Now, what's going on now, we've got so many people now beginning to catch on to the idea that, yes, judgment has come to America. That these storms, all these stuff that I've been prophesying since in the, in the 90s, about all the hurricanes, the tornadoes. I, I, I prophesied the, the amount of tornadoes in 94 would double in one year in, this, in the Midwest. And it had doubled in one year, just exactly what God had told me. That these storms, the fires that was going to take place, the drought that was going to take place, the floods that was going to take place. Bless God, that, that one after another, the earthquakes, the, the volcanoes, the things that was going to, uh, it was all prophesied. And bless God, and, and again, what do you think that, what do you think that this uh, that, that's going on now? People are now beginning to say, well, now I think I believe that. So now all of a sudden we're having these frustration dreams or a familiar spirit is coming in and we're standing up and saying, oh yeah, there's going to be an earthquake that's going to happen out here in Oregon on Father's Day and going to destroy these two great cities. And it's because of sin and they're having a gay parade just like they were having in New Orleans, you know. And, and what's it about? People getting on the, trying to climb on the boat, they ought to have got on the boat how many years ago? Huh? 16, 17 years ago? No, no, they're climbing on a boat now that, bless God, that has already sailed. See, and, I, and again, if you would check to find out, I, I, again, I don't know everything that God's going to do. I'm not stupid enough to believe that God can't do something without telling me, because He can. But what I know is this is, that if you'll be smart enough if you believe that you're one of these all called to God that's got all these visions, dreams, and whatever from God, just email the things to me, and when I can get around to reading them, don't prophesy them. Let me, let me read them, and if, I, if you don't hear from me, bless God, in the next 18 years, go ahead and prophesy it. <laughs> I don't believe I said 18 years. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't mean 18 years. <laughs> I'm kidding, okay. I'll get back with you. If it's wrong, you'll hear from me. Give it some time, but you'll hear from me. Because you see, you know, it, right now, right now, is it anything new for somebody to stand up and say, oh, oh, we're going to have, it wasn't new for somebody to say that there was going to be a, a hurricane hit New Orleans. No, that's not new. I prophesied that. I, I traveled the whole, the whole Gulf Coast and up the, the east side of, 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 of blessed God of, of Florida telling them people when that dream, that vision come. Get out of there, sell, some, sell these things while you got something to sell and leave and get in land somewhere. Because these, these hurricanes are going to become stronger and stronger, more powerful and more powerful. They're going to come in, blow your places down. You're going to rebuild them. They're going to blow your places down. They're going to come one after another, after another, after another. And that wasn't even starting to happen in the early 90s. But boy, it is today, isn't it? So what are you really saying, oh, a hurricane, a hurricane? What are you really saying when you say that? that you have confirmation to what some other prophet, fine, then the thing to do is write to me, call me, and let me have the confirmation. I'm saying, hey, I, that, that very well is right. But when you start saying, well, no, 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 Brother Decker, no, I'm just going to tell you right now, there's going to be a hurricane that's going to come in Miami on the 5th day of August. Now, when you start telling me that, then I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to mark your name down. And what I'm saying, well, I'm going to tell you what I, I've suggested. I've suggested that we open up a website and all these clowns that have prophesied all this stuff that hadn't come to pass, that we list it on the website. We list their names on the website, and then everybody can just list all the false prophets, and we just call it falseprophet.com. All right? And everybody that misses will just put their name in there. And then we can say, well, I'll just go to falseprophets.com, and if their name's not there, maybe I can listen. But if their name's there, there's no sense me getting cursed over listening to something they've already cursed themselves over. There's a well of an idea in there. Oh, dear God in heaven. Like, like I've got time to be doing 
<laughs> falseprophets.com. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> oh, don't get me started. I no more got time to do falseprophets.com than I do, bless God, to, uh, a lot of other things. But, but what I'm saying, though, there ought to be some way to identify these people. There ought to be some way. You know, they, they, somebody the other day asked me if I knew some, this that guy or that guy. I said, no, I don't know who that is. I said, oh, well, they prophesied some pretty big things, you know. And I said, well, then mark them down. All you got to do is just mark it down if they, and, and see if they, can. if they don't. Then bless God, don't listen to those kind of people. See that? But we've got, this, we've got this competition going on where we've got people trying to, out, can I use this, out-prophesy other people. Okay? And if I can out-prophesy you, then that makes me more important than you, doesn't it? And you know how God sees it? Not at all that way. No, we read it before. You know, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is what? Better than sacrifice. So, so you realize that if you're into, if you're into obedience then you're into the thing that God wants you to be in. And that's the reason I keep saying, sit back, take a deep breath, and relax. And every time that you have a dream, every time that you have a vision, a visitation of some sort, just write it down. Keep your mouth shut. Mail it, email it to me if you want to. I'll be glad to read it. But watch that thing. And if you can get enough of those in a line and you can get about 10 or 15 of them, oh, I can't wait that long, prophet. Yeah, well, you need to wait that long, prophet. And if you can get enough of those come in line, bless God, of 15 or 20 of them, and they're all right, then you can get to figuring, hey, I must have something going on between me and God. Until then, keep your mouth shut and just sit down and watch. People won't do that. The, the thing that that pastor should have done in Oregon should have been he should have written it down he should hit it away, and when it doesn't happen, throw it in the trash, and nobody's any smarter. He didn't hurt himself, and he didn't hurt anybody else. But he didn't do that, did he? He hurt himself, and he cursed himself, and he cursed anybody else that would listen. Well, the, uh, this, uh, this evening, the message this evening that we're going we're gonna to get on is, uh, 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 bless God, let's see, do I have it here? Is speaking... Uh, the Lord's name in vain. And we're going we're to begin to talk about that, and we're going to begin to talk about what that is really about, how serious it is, because it's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not speak the name of the Lord in vain. And you see, again, most of us have not the foggiest idea in this world what that's all about. Folks, this prophet right here, and I said it before, and I'm going to close this session by saying it again. The scariest thing that still happens to me today is when I have to prophesy some coming event. It's the scariest thing that still, at 30 years of this, and I'm still saying it could be a familiar spirit. I've got ways to check, and we're going to talk about the checks and the balances of this thing how to try to keep this thing to the place where you don't jump out here. Because, folks, I'm going to tell you something. Well, Any time that you prophesy something and you get it right, do you know what the powers of darkness are doing? Well, get him to prophesy again. We will send forth an angel of darkness, a familiar spirit, as an angel of light. We'll set him up. We'll get that group of people going that way. And then they don't want to have to worry about them because God wants them to go that way and we got them that way. We're, 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 in, we're in good shape. And that, you know, and there again, that's when I become, I, I, you know, the, the, I'd like to say it's a holy rage. I'm not sure that holy is a proper word to put in it. But I'm always saying they need to be slapped and that's figuratively, thank you. But the fact of it is that we're hurting the program of God doing those things. We're, we're hurting it and we don't even understand. Folks, the spirit world is smarter than we are. Can you, see, and I, I, and I know that you don't really know that. The spirit world has been around forever. How long? I've been around 60 years. That's a long way from ever, isn't it? Those spirits, those familiar spirits, know exactly how to do what they're doing. And we get so stupid that we use this up here thinking, oh, I'm a child of God. God would never let a familiar spirit come on me, and I can, would never say anything that wasn't of God because I'm being led by the Holy Ghost. So you think. And if that's what you believe, again, you've already been deceived. You've already missed God. The game's over. You've been had. This thing is life and death, folks. It's as serious as it gets, 
and yet we've got people out here playing with this thing like it was a yo-yo. And it enrages me to believe that people can, will put up with this stuff. And then let me tell you something, and we'll try to get done with this one. I close a number of times, as you know, before I close. I mean, I don't know, it's just one of those. Now for the closing. I already closed, well, I'll close one more time. Uh, and I won't mention this, this fellow's name, but he's a well, well, very well-known uh, televangelist. He was in a country of, uh, I'll tell you the country, it's Malawi. I went in to hold a, a crusade, and I came in about a week after this guy had been there, and he was in one of the cities, and most of those people have been saved about 25 to 30 times within that year, not talking about the prior year. And, but they show up. But what this guy did was he advertised miracles and healings. So they began to bring the people that were sick, the people that need miracles, the blind, the, the, the halt, the lame, the diseased. And the way I know this all happened was one of our ministers runs the government PA system. And so he was a, there was a technician, and so he was there every night being sure that everything was set up and was being run. He didn't actually do any of it. He just made sure that it was set up. But he was there. And he said, you know, prophet, he said, the man was here uh, uh, three nights. The place was filled with about 60 to 70,000 people. It was a soccer stadium, a football stadium, they call it over there. And he said, not one person was healed. On the last night, they found out what hotel he was staying in, and they began to push into the hotel a mob. They were going to stone the man to death because he promised that there would be healings. He promised there would be miracles, and there was not one miracle nor one healing that was found in those three nights of ministry. The third world doesn't take it very well. The same thing happened in Indonesia. I went in there after a man had been in there. Now, this guy wasn't very well known, but he went in and popped off his mouth. They brought all the people, and they were going to kill him. They actually had a hold of him and was taking him to stone him, and finally the police got there and stopped it. See, they don't take this quite as lightly in America. In America, it's ho-hum. Nobody's really going to get healed, but we all think they are, and we all believe in healing, so let's go see if somebody gets lucky. The third world doesn't work that way. When you start telling them people in the third world that somebody is coming that possesses an anointing that will cause the lame to walk and the blind to see, the disease to be healed and those things in the name of Yeshua Jesus, I'm going to tell you something. They will come expecting, and when that stuff happens, they'll keep coming expecting and keep coming expecting and keep coming expecting. But the thing of it is, you don't want to go over there and start... They, see, they don't, they, they, they don't take quiet... As, as kindly to being duped as the church does. But you see, the church, we're so smart, aren't we? Oh, we're so smart. We, you know, we're, we're much smarter than them over there. No, I'm going to tell you something. I stood out in the bush one, one Shabbat, one Sabbath. I looked out those people and I began to cry. Have nothing. Kids don't have toys. They have dirt for floors. Fifteen people live in one little old hut the size of this corner over here. In the rainy season, they can't even get out. It rains so hard, so they have to defecate and urinate in the hut. I said, God, they don't have anything. Why? Why do we in America think that we've got it all and I prophesied and I told him, I said, you're not wretched, you're not naked, and you're not poor. America is wretched, naked and poor. Doesn't even know it. Don't even know it. The judgment of God's coming down. This country doesn't even know it, doesn't believe it. And it's coming, and it's coming with a vengeance. And yet those people in the third world, <laughs> do you know they're hardly going to know that a famine came because they live in a famine all of their lives? They don't have money. They don't have electricity. They don't have cars. If you have a bicycle where I go, you're almost knowing you'd be the upper middle class if you owned a bicycle. And yet they are going to be the ones that have it all in the end because they're going to have Yeshua.
they're going to have you. And America's going to run around playing these games, acting oh so holy and so mighty, and we're going to end up holding nothing in our hand. And it's not because some old prophet like me was afraid to stand and tell America the truth. Because I've told America. That's why I wear black. I mourn for my country. I mourn for this country. We've defiled the living God, and nobody seems to care. Nobody. Only a few seem to care. They're having church tomorrow. They've defiled Sabbath, they don't keep new moon, and they think the festivals is a joke. And that's the only thing that's going to get you through it, plus the testimony of Yeshua. And yet we stand around in America and we've got all this and most homes have got two cars and mess, God, we got... You know, all he said, you know, it's something when you go somewhere and you, you find people that don't have but a hand of, full of rice to feed a whole family for 30 days. And the thing I keep saying, when's the last time you knew that you had a handful of rice and it had to last just you 30 days? You've never known that, but you're going to. You're going to know every bit of it before this thing's over. Sad, it's going to be the saddest thing that ever. You know why? Because the people of America would not hearken unto the prophet. They just flat are not interested in the prophet and what he's got to say. If I was to ask you today, how many of you people, after hearing the preparation that Don and I have done for this flu, uh, bird flu, how many of you people are actually putting up food I wouldn't even want you to start raising your hands. Some of you started, and some of you didn't do nothing else about it, did you? You know what you're really saying? Well, you know, well, you know, I believe it, but, you know, it's coming. It's going to happen, and when it does, don't you come beating on my door, because I'm going to have my oil lamp full, and it's going to be burning bright. Who do we think we are to defile the living God? Who do we think we are to shake our fist in the, hand of, in the face of God and saying, look, God, we'll take it from here? Who do we think we are? I'll tell you who we think we are. We think we now have become our own God. We don't believe that we need, it, need the living God anymore because look at us. We have everything. And God is about to take everything that we thought we had and he's about to take every bit of it away from us. As I said, folks, the stock market is going to go straight down the tubes. Your money, you can burn it. It's not going to be any good when this thing happens. And, and yet, uh, you know, you hear me say, put up food, put up water. You say, but when, but when, but when? Does it matter when? The fact of it is, does it matter? Do you believe that it's going to happen? Or are you stupid enough to believe that somehow God is just overlooking America because somehow this is America? No, I'm sorry. God has not overlooked America. What God has done is desperately tried to get America to repent, and America will not repent. America refuses to repent. And now we're at the place we're at, and there's no alternatives. God is going to, God is going to drop the hammer, and when that hammer drops... God help all of us. Because you know what I see in the whole deal? The sad part of it is I've got to go through this with the rest of them knuckleheads. And so do you. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. That's sad. You stop and think about that. Why would I have to go through this? And why would I have to go through this if I know that, it, that they need to repent? I'll tell you why. Because the consistency of God shows the same thing. Jeremiah, they all had to go. They all went into captivity. Right along with Israel, they went. They were punished. The things took place. Why? Because you see, we're not above all this either. I am an American. I live here in this land, and so do you. And because you think that they're wrong does not make us right. 
Because as long as they, and you know, I, I said somebody, somebody at lunch, I said, you know, when this whole thing came down and Clinton got put into office and, and God said, you stand in the beamer, you prophesy and you tell the people that this nation no longer can call itself a Christian nation. To stop. To stop it right now. Because we had elected for the first time in the history of this great nation, we elected a president that stood on a, on a platform, on a forum that included homosexuality and, and, and bless God, abortion, and elected him. Where was the church at? If this is a Christian nation, how did that happen? Somebody tried to tell me because I've wanted to know for years. What happened to us? I'll tell you what happened. We are fragmented so badly that we can't stand together. We're not together. You call it Christianity, what, what's that mean? You can call it whatever you want to call it, but bless God, everybody that belongs to whatever church happens to be that, they're all right, everybody else is wrong, and so it goes forth, and they all say, well, let the Baptists do it, let the Pentecostals do it, but, but you know, we're, we're, and it comes down to it, we're afraid to stand up. And I said, I said all the way back, I said all the way back, bless God, what president was it? All the way back, I think back in the days of, uh, bless God, even before Jimmy Carter. Um, no, I'll tell you what, it was uh, back in the days when uh, uh, Reagan was president. I said before he became president, I said if this nation doesn't stand up and start the Christian coalition come together and take control of the things that's got to happen in this country, this country is going to go straight to the, straight to the dogs. And, and when that happened with Clinton, the, uh, the Lord said, you prophesy and tell the people that this is the beginning of a long, hard fall for America because I will bring America all the way to her knees. And that's when he showed me the famine. He showed me the blood. He showed me the nuclear stuff. He showed it all to me. And he said, it is coming like a vengeance. What can you do and I do? Believe God. See, that's all, again, part of what I'm trying to do is to get the... the and, and, and folks, for me, it looks like an impossible task to get you ready so you can go out when that time comes and the meal runs out of the barrel, if it does, and you pray and the food come on your table or you go out and pick it up off the grass every morning. And that's where I have to bring you in order to survive this thing. And you know how about how close I am to doing that right now? Being able to fly back to where I live tonight just by flapping the, my tallit. That's just about how close I am to that. I am concerned for you. I'm concerned for the church. But the church doesn't seem to be real concerned about anything besides flying away, sweet Jesus. Stand up, we're going to pray. Thank you, Lord. Father God, when the loom, this room would light up you wouldn't be in the room, and I will be wherever it is that God wants me, all right? And then that's when God begins to say, what do you see? And I tell him, and then, then we go to the next whatever it is, and he says, look at this, what's this about? And I tell him, and he says, prophesy this, prophesy that, stand and tell the people this. So the open visions, and, 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 and folks, I, you know, again, I think one of the things that if I could convey to everyone that's here this weekend you see, it's very simple for me to do what I do because I'm anointed of God to do it. See, I, I, my Lord and my God, how do you misread an open vision? Now, I see where those dreams can be a real problem, all right? And I see where you people that are hearing this little small voice speak to you or trying to call an audible voice, I can see why you're in trouble. I don't, I don't even have a problem with that one, all right? But, I, with, with you, but you see, with an open vision, it's all there. It's like looking at you. I, but Brother Sig, you have a blue shirt on. You have a flowered dress on. You have, I think that's a kind of a green top, okay? It's real simple. I see it. Unmistakably. I, 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 you know, I've talked about how it took years to develop it, and it did. But now that it's developed, I mean, bang, it comes, and I see it. Now, what's a closed vision? A closed vision, now listen closely, and this is the only way I've ever known how to explain it. It's sort of seeing with your mind's eye. Oh, I love that. That's an escape route that don't ever forget I said. <laughs> you think you saw that. I would be real close. I'd be real, I'd be real scared of them closed things, all right? And again, 
you don't you don't run into people that that operate in open visions very often, not real open visions. What most people are going to uh, again, everybody has these dreams, and you know I keep I keep. But see, when this all happened, I was a young man. All right, I told you I was eight, I was somewhere around eight, eight, maybe seven years old when the visions started coming in my in my life. And so um, anyway, I you know I got used to being different and very different at a very early age. And so, uh, but 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 during all of that. When, when you examine it, you begin, I, I, I begin to think, well, the dreams, the dreams, see, the dreams are tough because dreams can be symbolistic. And, and if you're not real careful about dreams, I have a lot of people will call or email me and say, I had this dream, do you have any idea what it means? Well, sometimes, God, bang, I do, and sometimes I don't. If I do, I'll sit down and write them back and say, yeah, this is what I picked up from it, this is what I think that God is saying about the interpretation of it. Now, you know, what are you saying? What do you think? And, but I think those people that rely on the dreams, I'm going to tell you something, folks. I know Daniel had dreams. I know there are a lot of dreams and Joseph had dreams. And I know things that happened in the Bible were dreams. You know, and it's easy for me to say this, but for me, I'm glad that I have open visions. Maybe that's the reason after 30 years I've never missed in any of this stuff. Because when them open visions come, see, I'm smart enough to know, and you don't think God doesn't speak to me dozens of things every day? Things that I, and you'll, you'll hear me at times say, well, I think, you know, you've heard me, I think the dispensation of grace is either over in the next year, year and a half, going to be over. And I've said that numbers of times. I think that. I don't, and I say every time, I don't have a vision for that, so I name that Thomas 1-1, that maybe that'll happen and maybe it won't. I, I don't know, it's a guess. It's just something that I, I, I picked up, some things that I picked up in the spirit world. Now, that's what I think most people are doing. I think most people are picking up some things in the spirit world, and then they're running their mouth off about it, and then, bless God, then they don't come to pass. They go, ooh, I hope nobody heard that but me, you know. Woo, woo, I hope nobody calls my hand about it. No, that wasn't exactly what I said, brother. What I said was that, and then we start making excuses, then we start lying, then we start this, then we start that, and then what happens? We're in a heap of trouble. And, and that's what we're trying to do this weekend. We're trying to get this weekend you to a place where you will evaluate yourself because I'm not here to do that. I'm not here going, and I'm not.